If you have an Oxbridge interview for engineering, CS, maths, or natural science, then it's very, very likely that you will get a graph sketching interview question. Most students don't know how to answer them effectively because they don't have a good, reliable system to help them answer these graph sketching questions correctly. So in this video, we're going to cover through all of that and help you smash your interview. If you don't know me, my name is Aria. I'm an engineer here at Cambridge, and here's my favorite five-step process to answer any Oxbridge graph sketching question. Okay, so here's the technique that will let you master Oxbridge graph sketching. I personally memorize it through a mnemonic, so sketch it to amaze professors, which is admittedly kind of cringe, but whatever, it helps you remember it. Or you can just use SITAP. So then just breaking it down, you want to work chronologically through the steps to sketch the graph. So starting with S for symmetry, you want to check if the function is odd or check if the function is even. And you want to do this first because this will save you a lot of time at the end when you sketch the graph. And to show you what I mean, here's an example of an even function. So y equals x to the 4. And if you've drawn one part of the function on the right hand side, all you have to do is to reflect it in the y axis to get the other side. And it's the same case for odd functions, except you have to reflect it twice, once in the y axis and once in the x axis. So as you can see, reflecting the function saves you a lot of time. So make sure you identify quickly if there's any symmetry within the function you're graphing. Keep in mind that symmetry also includes looking at the periods of the function. So for example, if there is like a sine or cos term within your function, then it will repeat every two pi radians or whatever, depending on the function. And doing all of this in the first stage of the process is really, really useful because it can give you an idea of the behavior of the function before you've even started graphing it. Okay, so next up we have intersections, which is probably the most obvious one that students go for. This is where you ask yourself, you know, does the function cross the origin? or you find the roots of the function, so the values of x when y is zero, and the y-intercepts, the values of y when x is zero. This one's probably the most intuitive to understand because you literally just mark out the points that you know the function goes through, and then the rest of these steps are gonna help you work out what the actual function looks like. Okay, then, so for t, we have turning points, and again, this is another simple one. You literally just work out the derivative, set it to zero, and then just mark out your points in a very similar way to what you did with the intersections. However, it's worth bearing in mind that you don't always need to differentiate to find the turning points of the function. Like, for example, if you were given this as your function, it's quicker to just complete the square and work out your turning points that way. So don't always be in a rush to differentiate the function. There are other ways you can work out the turning points. Like, for example, you could use symmetry. So if you knew the graph had a shape like this, and you knew it was symmetric, and you knew it had roots at like 2 and 8, then you know the midpoint of the graph would be at 5, and that's where the stationary point would be. Also, sometimes with the function they give you, you don't even know how to differentiate it. So don't make differentiating like your first objective. I actually think jumping straight into the differentiation is a common mistake that students make in their interviews because there's a lot you can learn about the shape of the function without differentiating and without jumping straight into the dense algebra. Also, just dealing with the dense algebra can lead to a lot of silly mistakes. So while I do think turning points are useful, make sure you've gathered as much information as you can about the function before differentiating first. Moving on to A for asymptotes, we have vertical asymptotes and we have horizontal asymptotes. And if you look at the top example over here, you know it has a vertical asymptote right down that line. And if you look at the other example, you'll notice that it has a horizontal asymptote along this line. And both of these were just a quick example to show you what horizontal and vertical asymptotes look like. Now let's move on to how we can figure out if there are any asymptotes in our graph. To find out if your graph has any vertical asymptotes, it should be in the form of some sort of fraction like this, with the bottom denominator being equal to zero, because obviously dividing by zero will make the whole expression go to plus or minus infinity. So for example, if we're drawing this graph, we notice that at x equals two, the bottom denominator is equal to zero. So that means there's a vertical asymptote when x is equal to two. So if you're also drawing a graph with fractions like these, Make sure you're careful and make sure you understand that if the bottom function is zero, then it will have a vertical asymptote. By the way, just a side note about vertical asymptotes, they don't have to be of the form of a fraction. For example, if you're sketching the graph of log x, you will notice that it has a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. It's just that fractions are the most common form of vertical asymptotes. For horizontal asymptotes, it's a little bit more tricky, but you have to ask yourself what happens if x goes to plus or minus infinity. So for example, if we're given this function, as x goes to plus or minus infinity, then the denominator tends to infinity, so then y tends to zero. And as another example, if we're given this function, then as x tends to plus or minus infinity, these terms get overpowered and the x squares cancel out, so y tends to three over six, which is just a half. 
Okay, finally, we have P for pattern. And this one's a bit more vague, but it's basically asking yourself a series of questions to determine the pattern and the shape of the function. For example, is the graph reciprocal? And if it is, then it'll probably have some shape similar to something like this. Or does the graph have some sort of sine or cos term, which means it will probably have a sinusoidal shape looking like something like this. Or is the graph exponential or logarithmic, in which case it might have a shape like this or like this. Or does your graph have some sort of polynomial element? So for example, if it's a quadratic, it has a U shape. If it's a cubic, it has some sort of shape like this. And if it's a quartic, it has a W shape looking like this. This stage is deliberately a little bit more vague and there's not really a step-by-step -step algorithm which you can follow. You're basically trying to connect the dots between the functions that you already know the shape of, like these, to the graph that you're given using pattern recognition. Okay, now we're going to move on to some Oxbridge interview graph sketching questions to show you how to implement this tool in practice. Okay, so say we were asked to sketch the graph of y equals e to the sine x. Now let's just go through our steps in order to find out how to graph it. So starting with s for symmetry, we can quickly check with a bit of algebra that the function isn't odd nor even. However, you know that there's a sine x term within the function, and since you know sine x is periodic, you know that the graph will probably repeat itself. Okay then, moving on to the intersections, we know that when y is 0, e to the sine x is 0, but e to the something can never be equal to 0, so we know that this function has no roots. And when x is 0, we know y is equal to the e to the sine of 0, which is just 1, so we can just mark that point over here. After that, if we look at the turning points, we can find a derivative for the function by differentiating this, which gets us cos x times e to the sine x. And if we equate this to zero, we get these as our x solutions. And if we sub them back into here, we get the corresponding y values. And then after that, we can just make a rough sketch. So we know that the value of e is roughly equal to three. And we know that the value of one over e is roughly equal to 0.4. And then boom, we can just very simply plot all our points on the graph with their respective x and y coordinates. Now let's check if our function has any vertical or horizontal asymptotes. And we notice that nothing actually happens as x goes to plus or minus infinity, because if we look at the function, it's periodic, so it just bounces between these values. And likewise, for the same reasoning, since we know that this function is periodic, we also know that it has no horizontal asymptotes. And finally, if we look at pattern, we know that this function over here has an exponential shape. So when the graph is rising, it's going to be an increasing exponential like this. And when the graph is falling, it's going to be a decreasing exponential like this. So your graph is going to look something like this. Now you'll notice that the bottom part of the graph or the valley of the graph is very flat, whereas the top of the graph or the hill is very steep. Now this is because the graph is an exponential, so it has an exponential shape, but you could also reason it with the derivative. Because if you look at the e to the sine x part, at minus pi over 2, it's e to the minus 1, and at pi over 2, it's e. So at minus pi over 2, the derivative is very small, but at pi over 2, the derivative is much bigger which explains why it's much flatter around here and much steeper here. Now, graph sketching can be a challenging topic for students with many people having misconceptions, which is why I would recommend a tool such as Brilliant. Brilliant has a wide range of graph sketching lessons that will help you click with topics that you previously struggled with. Brilliant was also crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and more. So it's engineered to personalize your learning at your ideal pace, making it super effective. What I love about Brilliant is that it has courses on coordinate geometry, coordinate planes, exponential functions, and a brand new course on coordinate transformations, which are all extremely important concepts for graph sketching. And by using Brilliant, you'll be able to fill in the gaps of your knowledge and master these concepts ready for your interview. As always, Brilliant has interactive lessons allowing you to rotate and translate shapes and change coordinates, all while focusing on the visual element so you can intuitively understand how different functions will affect the graph. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash aryaharakrishnan or just scan the QR code if you hate typing. By using any of these links, Brilliant will give you 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant, so enjoy. Okay, let's work through another example. Here our problem is to sketch y equals cos e to the x. Once again, we're going to work through our steps, starting with s for symmetry. A quick check on the function shows you that it's not odd nor even. And if you have a brief look at the period, the term inside the cos function increases as x increases. So the period is not constant. Now, if we look at the intersections, if we're trying to find the roots when y is equal to 0, then cos e to the x must be 0. So e to the x must be pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and so on. Then if we just ln both sides, we get x as these values. And from here, we can say that there are no negative roots. How can we say that? Well, if you look at the graph of ln x, 
you know that this point over here must be equal to 1. And you know that the pi over 2 from here, from the first x solution, lies somewhere to the right of 1, which you can tell has a positive solution. So you can tell that there are no negative roots. Another thing about this ln x graph is that it has this tapering off effect. So if we try to plot the value of ln 3 pi over 2, which is somewhere to the right of pi over 2, so roughly around here, we see that it has a very, very similar y coordinate. And if we just extend the graph a little bit so we can plot the value of 5 pi over 2, then we see that the y values get even closer together. So as we go from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2 to 5 pi over 2 and so on, the y values get more and more and more squished. And since these y values represent the roots of our original equation, it means that the roots get more and more squished. We also know that when x is 0, y is equal to cos e to the 0, which is just cos of 1. So just to draw that on the graph, we know that the y-intercept is cos of 1. We also know that there's no negative root, so we can just leave this section blank. And we also know that the positive roots are ln pi over 2, ln 3 pi over 2, ln 5 pi over 2, and so on. And the roots get closer and closer together. So now we can move on to find the turning points of the function. So we can just differentiate and then set that equal to 0. And then we get e to the x is pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. So x is just ln of those values. And likewise, if you plot the ln graph for these values, you will see that these values also get really squished. And since these values represent the minimum and maximum of the cos function, they must be between 1 and minus 1. So if you just sub these values back into here, you get y is equal to minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, and so on. Then we can just plot those points on our graph. I've only plotted 3 so it doesn't get too cramped. And the minimum points are at the line y equals minus 1, and the maximum points are the line y equals 1. Next, we can look at the asymptotes. So for this particular function, there are no vertical asymptotes. But there is a horizontal one because as x tends to minus infinity, e to the x tends to 0. So then cos e to the x, which is just y, tends to 1. So basically, as x tends to minus infinity, y tends to 1. So if we just draw out the horizontal line at y equals 1, we know that as x tends to minus infinity, the function gets closer and closer to that line. Then finally, in pattern, we know that this function is a sinusoidal shape, so it looks something like this. Then we can literally just connect the dots, aiming to get that sinusoidal shape. And as you can see, as x tends to infinity, the function gets more and more bunched up. My drawing's pretty terrible, but you get the idea. Okay, my drawing was actually pretty bad. Here's the actual graph in Desmos for reference. Okay, here's a very important point. When most people think of graph sketching, they think they're given a function and then they have to draw it. But in your interview, you could equally be asked the opposite. So you could be given a graph and you have to guess what type of function it is. And a lot of students forget to practice this skill and only focus on this skill when you could also be asked this in your interview. But don't worry, I got you. So to ensure you're prepared, we're going to go through an example like this. Okay, say we got given this graph and our problem is to work out what type of function it is. And one of the best things about SITAP is that you can literally just work backwards from the graph to find out the function. So once again, for the final time, let's go through these steps in order. So just starting with symmetry, we can see that the function is odd because if you reflect it in this line and this line again, you get the same function. So the function is odd, and if we take a look at the period, we can see that there's a period of pi between the roots. Okay, so we've done symmetry, let's work on intersections. We're given the roots of the function, and we can see that they all form the roots of the cos graph. So our function must be cos x times some other function. Okay, so we've done intersections, and what do we know so far? We know that the function is odd, and we know that the function is made up of cosine. Turning points won't really help us here because we're not given the values of the stationary points. So moving on to asymptotes, we can see that there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 and a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So can we think of a function that multiplies with cosine to give a horizontal and vertical asymptote at 0? And we can, because if we choose 1 over x, then at x equals 0, there's a vertical asymptote. And when x goes to plus or minus infinity, 1 over x goes to 0. So that also means there's a horizontal asymptote. However, you could be asking, wait, hang on a second. Why can't g of x be 1 over x squared, 1 over x to the 4, 1 over x to the 6, and so on? That also has a vertical asymptote, and that also has a horizontal asymptote. But remember, in our symmetry argument, we said that the function had to be odd, so it can't be any of these even powers. However, it could be one of these odd powers instead of 1 over x, which could be a talking point in your interview, but for the sake of simplicity, let's just say that the interviewer just told us it was 1 over x. Okay, so just to clean that all up, we've done asymptotes, we know that the function is made up of cosine and 1 over x, and maybe some other function, and we know that it's odd. Then finally, you can look at pattern and convince yourself that the cosine term and 1 over x term represent all the characteristics of the function, so we don't even need this last function multiplied at the end. So just tidying that all up, our final function would then be cosine of x over x 
times by some constant because we don't know what the values of these stationary points are. And actually, if we were given these values for the turning points, we could then work out our function exactly. So there we go. We worked through all the steps and worked out our mystery function. Now you're not gonna actually learn anything if you don't put this method into practice. So here's my challenge for you guys. Here's a random function that I've created on Desmos in the form of y to the n equals function of x. And your job is to use sitap and find out what this is equal to. And remember the n here doesn't have to be one, it could be two, three, four, or whatever. And post your answer in the comments so I can tell you if you were right. Oh, by the way, the 0.707 stuff is just root two over two. I don't know why Desmos writes it like that. So yeah, good luck with the challenge, good luck with your interview, and I'll see you in the next video.